2. Galatians chapter 2. If you were here in the Sunday school hour, um, I explained that um, I was planning on being in 1 John chapter 3 uh, this morning, and I even said that Sunday night and Wednesday night, and that was the plan. But I'll just be honest with you, I'm not ready yet. And so, uh, because I'm not ready, uh, I'm not going to try to bring it to, uh, to the pulpit. And um, some tough words ahead for us in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3. And so, um, I wasn't quite comfortable. And so, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to preach it. And so, I just asked the Lord yesterday, um, and really all day yesterday, just tried to think about it when, on my mind. Uh, God, what do you have for us this morning? And he made it clear uh, that this is where he wanted us to be. And so I uh, got here and made sure it was ready to go and studied it out even, even more. Uh, but if you were here in the Sunday School Hour, we talked about meditating and, and chewing on the cud, chewing on the word. And uh, that's what yesterday was. It was just a lot of that process. And so uh, just a quick plug for Sunday School. Um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to be here, we're learning how to study God's Word. And so these are tools that Pastor uses. These are tools, uh, part of uh, even my process. And so just want to encourage you to be here, get involved, get plugged in in Sunday school in your class. And, and uh, we'll learn how to study God's Word together. And I'm thankful for the time that we get to do that. But we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. We're going to start our reading in verse 15. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 the Bible says this, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I may live unto God. Very well known verse here. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Think about those last few words. Christ is dead in vain. The sacrifice that God made being made void, being empty, is that possible? It's not. We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time that we've had so far worshiping you uh, through our singing and our giving. God, I do ask that over the next couple of minutes as we preach and as we go through your word that you'll make it clear. God, give me the words to say. Lord, I pray that you'll help it to be evident uh, what your word says. Lord, we thank you for the truth in it. Lord, I pray that you'll use it this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in a new book in Galatians, and so we've got to know what's going on. Uh, we can't just hop into the middle of the book. If you've been here in Sunday school, uh, I've warned against that about 500 times in my class. And so we're not going to do that this morning. So we're going to talk about what's going on in Galatians. Uh, this, this is a church that was established by Paul on one of his missionary journeys. And so John, uh, Paul rather is going out and he's preaching the gospel all over Asia Minor, Asia Minor and all over Europe. And, and he's preaching in these areas. And as people begin to get saved, he's starting these churches. And so these churches are in these specific towns. Uh, to, uh, uh, the book Phil Philippians would be to the church at Philippi. And the book of Galatians is at the church of Galatia. The book of Ephesians is at the church of Ephesus. And so uh, you can see where we're getting our titles from. It's just where they are. And so the, 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 the Jewish people that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior are here in Galatia. And they, they have started a church after many people have accepted what Jesus did for them. And they've been saved. Okay. So before we go any farther, we're just going to have to talk about what that means. Because on a Sunday morning in church, we're pretty all familiar with, with what knowing God means. But, but I want to make sure that we're all clear just because we got to know who these people are and what they're facing. These are Jewish people who are chosen by God. Okay, Jews were God's chosen people. We'll get into that here in just a second. 
But, but these are people who are not holding on to the Jewish way of life anymore. They have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what Jesus did for them on Calvary. Now, if that's foreign to you or if that's news to you, let me give you an overall idea of what happened. Man are sinners. Mankind are sinners. We are sinners. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means this, that we are sinners and our sin separates us from God. We fall short of God's glory. And so because of our sin and our sinful nature, and not only our sinful nature, but our sinful choices, we have been separated from a holy and just God. And God loved us so much that he sent his son to live a life here on earth and be a perfect sacrifice so that sinful man can have a relationship with a holy and just God. Okay, that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that verse means this, that Jesus came and he died for our sins so that we would not have to face the punishment of those sins but rather we can accept that gift that Jesus gave us when he died and rose again so that we as sinful men can have a relationship with a just and holy God. And these Jewish people in this area have believed that. They have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And now while they were one way, they are now a different way. While they were headed one direction, living under the law, living in the Jewish way of life, they have been confronted with Jesus Christ the Savior, and now they have placed their faith in Him and no longer in the law. And so because they've placed their faith in Jesus and no longer in the law, their life is different. They live different. They look different. Things are starting to change. In Galatians, we see words like this. We have liberty in Christ. We are no longer under the bondage of the law. We'll get into that here in just a second. But, but their life has actually changed dramatically. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ has, had did in dying on the cross and then placing their faith and trust in Him. And if you are here today and you have done that, you would agree your life is different after knowing Jesus than it was before knowing Jesus. And so there is a transformation that, that has taken place in our life, and there was a transformation that has taken place in their life. Now, like I said, the Jewish people were special. They were people that were chosen by God. If you go all the way back to Abraham, God chose Abraham to, to make Abraham to be the father of many nations. And it was Abraham that was going to be used by God to introduce one day the Messiah. Now, this Messiah was the one who would come and deliver people from their oppression. Okay, that was the idea. That was the design of God. And God chose Abraham. And of course, we know that God made a promise with Abraham that I will make you the father of many nations. Your, your offspring will be like the sand on the seashore, like the, the stars in the sky. Uh, they're going to be uncountable. You're going to have generation after generation. You're going to have a, a, a lot of offspring. And, and, but ultimately, the, the promise was this, that all of the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham's seed, okay? And that promise and the blessing that all of the nations of the earth get to experience is the Messiah, is, is ultimately who we know to be as Jesus Christ. And so Jesus would be a Jew as Abraham was a Jew, okay? And this was the design that God had from, from the very beginning. He wanted to use Abraham and Abraham's sons. He had many sons, Right? We know the song, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. If you go in church, you know what I'm talking about, right? We can stand up and get some exercise, but we're not going to. They're doing that over in children's church. But God chose Abraham and his offspring to be the avenue that the Messiah would come through. Now, do you think that it would be the devil's idea to cut that off? I think it would be. If, if the devil could cut off the Jewish people then what would happen? The Messiah couldn't come. So of course this family would be under attack. Of course this family would have a target on it. And, and it's no surprise uh, whether it's from the devil or just man being man and being sinful, a lot of things happen. 
And a lot of issues come about. Like Ishmael and Isaac. Like Jacob and Esau fighting and stealing birthrights and blessings and all of this. Jacob being a deceiver, doing whatever he can to get to himself what he can get for himself. A lot of different wives, a lot of different things going on in their lives. And then as we skip forward many generations, you even see uh, decisions made by King David like we talked about last Sunday night that could have very easily messed up a plan that God had from the beginning. And so man, when man gets involved with God's plan, we have the tendency to get in the way and to do the wrong thing. And so we see that over and over and over. So what God does is He introduces the law. Now there's two reasons why He introduces the law. Number one, it's to protect His people it's to protect his people and the line that one day a Messiah would come through. But number two, it's to show them that they are in need of a Messiah. To show them that they are not good enough. Uh, the, the Galatians, a couple chapters later, the next chapter, I believe, talks about how the law is their schoolmaster. Basically, what the law was designed to do was to show them that there is no possible way that they could live up to this standard that God had put into place. And it showed them that they fall short of the glory of God. But what happened over time was this law that was given was taken, and then that law was added to... And that law was ultimately a God to these people. This law transitioned from uh, just a way to show them that they needed a Messiah and a way to protect them from, from messing up the plan and the design that God had for them. But, but what happened was it changed from that to a standard that they had to live up to. It changed from being something that God used and wanted to use in a specific way, and man changed it to be used in a different way. So we'll talk about what that looks like. I, we don't have time to go through all the laws. Okay? We don't have time to go through, I believe, over 600 laws that the Jewish people were supposed to keep. But we can hit some of the big ones, some of the fun ones. Like, what are they allowed to eat? I love food. We've talked about that. That's no surprise to anybody here. Look at me. Okay, I know. My suit doesn't fit like it used to. All right? So they had very specific dietary rules. We talked about that Sunday night. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. There was food that they were allowed to eat, and there was food that they were not allowed to eat. Okay? And that was for their protection. We now know that uh, pork has uh, uh, bacteria in it that if it's not cooked properly, it can harm us. And so God put these things into place with clean and unclean food that they were and were not allowed to eat so that it would be a protection to them so that a Messiah could come through. It would be bad if food was what wiped out the entire Jewish population. So God put these things into place. The problem is what God designed to be the law, man added to that law. And now it wasn't what you could and couldn't eat. It became how you ate. And when you could eat. And, and, and it just, it, things got out of hand really, really quickly as generation after generation passed these laws down to another. There were other laws. Uh, one of the big ones and one of the main ones was the, the, the idea of circumcision. And, and this was put into place for God's people to be identified as unique and set apart. And so the, these were things that were, that were commanded by God for the Jewish people that would identify the Jewish people. And it was for them. And so that was another law that, that Jewish people had to maintain and that they had to uphold. So they had their dietary laws. They had their circumcision. They had laws on what clothes they could wear. They were not allowed to mix materials. We have shirts that are 50-50, cotton and polyester. That's a no-no for the Jews. Now, there's a lot of things that come into place here. I don't know why God did some of these things. I don't know why God set up some of these things. But what I do know is He asked His people to do things for a reason, and this reason was manipulated over time. Okay? The reason that He asked them to do things was, was for this purpose, and man added this purpose. 
And so there were rules for food, there were rules for circumcision, there were rules for what clothes they could wear, there were rules for uh, how they ought to respect the Sabbath day. I mean, it's one of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so the, the idea was this, that they would not work or that they would not do things on the Sabbath so that God got all of the glory and God got all of the focus. Because God deserves all of the glory and God deserves all of the focus. But again, man got involved. And all of a sudden, remembering the Sabbath day took on a different meaning. What does that look like? Well, you can't work on the Sabbath. So don't touch anything. Don't pick up anything. You're not allowed to go out and you're not allowed to reap harvest on the Sabbath. Because you're not remembering the Sabbath day. Now, is that an interpretation? Sure. But what happened was what God meant for one thing, man added to and added to and added to, to the point where in the New Testament we got down to where they couldn't pick up more than half of a fig. So in order to eat on the Sabbath day, according to the traditions of men, they had to cut a fig in half and only eat half at a time because if you pick up more than half of a fig, then you are sinning because you are working on the Sabbath. What kind of craziness are we talking about? All right? Is that what God intended when he wrote the Ten Commandments? No, it's not. So we can very clearly see that God had a design in place, and man took over and added what they wanted to it. And so in Galatians, where we pick up is we have Jewish people who have grown up under the law, and they are using the law as a standard by which they get their righteousness. That's the Jewish way of life. If you don't keep the law, then you're not right with God. If you don't keep up with all of the rules and the, the regulations for Jewish life, then you cannot have a relationship with God because you've broken His law and now God's mad at you. So because you picked up more than half of a fig, God's mad at you. And you cannot have a relationship with Him. Because you ate something that you were not supposed to eat, you now cannot have a relationship with God. So can you see where this is headed? This is turning into a works-based salvation where the only way that sinful man can have a proper relationship with God is if you do this, 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 and this. The only way that you're going to be able to know God the way that He wants you to know Him is if you live this way and you do these things and you, you wear this and you don't say this and you move here. I mean, we're talking about things that made them unclean. And these are traditions of men that were added to the law year after year. Uh, if they touched a Gentile, they were unclean. But what had been added over the years was if a shadow of a Gentile touched a pot... And then I, as a Jew, went and picked up that pot. I am now unclean because of the shadow of the Gentile that touched the pot. What are we talking about here? This is the chaos that is happening for God's people at this time. And what happened is the Jews in Galatia had placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and they are no longer under the law. They are in Christ. Okay? They have realized that their sin is what separates them from God. And instead of the law being what justified them with a holy and just God, they realized it was the sacrifice that Jesus, uh, that Jesus made when He died on the cross for their sins. And they placed their faith in Jesus. And in Jesus, they have now been justified to have a relationship with God. This is, these are the types of people that are in Jerusalem, or excuse me, in Galatia at this time. And there's a problem. Because there's a lot of Jewish people who still believe that the law is what justifies them, not Christ. And if you go to Galatians chapter 1, what you're going to see is this. These Galatians have been tricked. They have been pulled back into the old way of doing things. And they have, what Paul says, is bewitched them. They have completely turned what the truth is back into the law. So, so Paul, let's go there. Let's just turn back. Galatians chapter 1. Paul makes a point here to say this. 
There is a specific gospel that is intended for you, and you need to be aware of that. Look at verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So you are saved. You have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But there are people who have come onto the scene and they have influenced you in such a way that has told you it's not about Jesus, it's about the law. And so they are starting to go back into the law and serving the law. So he says this. Uh, let's read the last part of verse 6. Um, that is called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we say before, I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. This is what Paul's saying. Hey, I need you guys to pay attention here. So quickly, you have been pulled back to this other gospel, this other way of having a relationship with God. We know that you have to place your faith and trust in Jesus in order to have a relationship with God. But new people have come onto the scene and they are preaching another gospel to you, which was righteousness by the law. This is not another gospel. This is a false gospel. So what Paul does is he just lays it all out here as clearly as he can. I want you to understand that whether it's these guys or anybody else, if somebody preaches that there is another way to have a relationship with God other than through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, they are accursed. They are wrong. I don't care if an angel comes down from heaven and stands before you and says, this is the way it's supposed to be. That angel's wrong. Don't listen to him. The devil can take on the form. Right? I can think of a religion right now of a guy a couple hundred years ago who was out in a field or in a forest and met some angels who gave him some gold plates and other scriptures. I don't know what kind of an experience that was. I don't know if he just ate something weird the night before and he was hallucinating. I don't know. But I do know this, it could have been the devil disguising himself as an angel of light who's giving another gospel. There's a problem. Let him be accursed. It is not true. Why? Because we have already told you what Jesus Christ did on the cross and dying for your sins and raising again. Jesus is the way that sinful man has a relationship with God. Man is justified by placing their faith in Christ, not by any other means of any other gospel. And so Paul is just dumbfounded that these Christians who have placed their faith in Christ are now reverting back to their old way, their old life of trying to keep up with the law so that they can have a relationship with God. Here's the problem. That's bondage. That's bondage. And he even uses those words in Galatians. This life of trying to do the right thing and trying to obey all the rules and trying not to, to do the wrong thing. And all of these things, these are a bondage that you are carrying when you could have liberty and just knowing Christ and, and trusting what he did and, and, and his sacrifice being enough for you to have that relationship. Do you think it would be a hard life to remember how much weight you're allowed to pick up on the Sabbath? Do you think it would be a hard life to remember that you're not allowed to wear clothes that have different weaves with different materials? Do you think it would be a hard life to know, did a, a, did a shadow touch this pot? And if I pick up this pot, am I going to be unclean? These are all things that were taken out of the context of what God designed them to be. They were added to by the way of man. And there was now a standard that man had to keep in order to be righteous with God. And Paul's just clearing off a spot and saying this. It's not true. It's bondage. You cannot have a relationship with God based on your works. You cannot be good enough to go to heaven. You cannot keep enough laws to have a relationship with God so that God is happy with you. So that God is like, wow, great job. 
It just doesn't work like that. Why? Because we are sinners. And our sin is what separates us from God. And our righteousness is as filthy rags. The best that we can do, even if it is possible to keep up with every law and do every law plus every tradition of man, the best that anybody could ever do is filthy rags in the view of God. It does not work. All it does is tie you down and brings you into subjection of those laws. And Jesus came to save and to free. Their idea of the Messiah was that he would deliver them from their oppression, which they viewed as Rome. The problem is, God didn't come to free them from Rome. God came to free them from their oppression, which was their works, their sin. Trying to do and keep up with what God had said. And not what God had said, but what man had added to what God had said. The point of the law was not so that they would keep the law. The point of the law was to show them they can't keep the law. They have a need. And that need is the Messiah. And that need is Jesus Christ. And while they took those words and they made them to be something that God didn't intend them to be, they also took this idea of a Messiah and they, they made that idea of a Messiah different than what God intended that Messiah to be. They made this idea of a Messiah, somebody who's going to deliver them from the oppression of Rome, they missed the point that the Messiah was come to deliver them from the oppression of their sin. And so that's where we are here in Galatians with a group of people who Paul loves and Paul cares about, and they have already accepted Christ as their Savior, but now they are yoking themselves to this law again. And that's where we pick up here in, the, in our passage. These Jews begin to fall back into this mindset that they are God's chosen people. They're not sinners like the Gentiles. They're special. They're different. You can see it in verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles... We're not sinners. We're not oppressed by sin. Look at all we do. Look at all the laws we keep. Look at the lifestyle that we live. Look at our righteousness. Look at the Gentiles who have never done the law in their life. Knowing, verse 16, that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. There it is, right there. Paul lays it out so very clearly. You are not justified by doing the law. You cannot have a relationship by doing good works. You have a relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. He says it as clear as day. He says it three different times in three different ways to make sure that they don't miss it. You cannot be justified by the law. You cannot be good enough to have a relationship with God. You can't live the best way that you can live and do the best that you can do and be any closer to God. The only way that sinful man can have a relationship with the holy God is by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the only way that sinful man can be justified with the, with, the, with the holy God. That's how this works. And so he makes it very clear that this is the way that God designed it to be. You have to place your faith in Christ to have a relationship with him. And, and this is how it works. This is the design. And, and, and the argument for this was an argument that we hear today. Well, then if you just place your faith in Jesus, then you get to live however you want. And you, the, if the law doesn't matter, then you can just break any law and do whatever you want to do. And that's what the next verse they try to, uh, Paul goes out and he tries to just make it clear. No, we're not doing that. Why would we do that? God forbid. God forbid that a Christian would realize that he is a sinner, would realize that, that he is separated from God, and that very act that separated him from God, he now can just go and indulge in freely because he's saved forever? Well, no. Why would we do that? 
It doesn't make any sense. So he says it in the next two verses, and he just makes it very clear this is not what we are supposed to do. Verse 17, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Of course we're not going to do that. If God saved us from the very thing that separated us from himself, why would we then go and live in that very filth that separated us from him that he saved us from? We wouldn't do that. He says in verse uh, 18, If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Why would I go back to the things that took me away from God? Why would I do that? Of course I'm not going to do that. I want to live for him. Verse 19, for though the law, uh, for through the law am dead to the law, that I may live unto God. The purpose of knowing Jesus Christ is so that we can uh, have a relationship with God, but live through him. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Now this would have had a lot different of an understanding than what we have today. We know what crucified means, but they knew what crucified me meant. They lived under the oppression of Rome. They lived, well, in, in, Galatia, in Galatia, in that area, they were Roman. There were Roman people all around them. They, they knew what crucifixion meant. They knew how horrific it was. They knew that if you were crucified, you were going to die. And you were going to die a very hard and uh, awful death. So when Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ, that has some weight to it. That has some meaning to it. Nevertheless, I live. Oh, okay. So when we get, when we get saved and when we, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we don't have to be crucified. No, it's not a physical crucif uh, uh, crucifixion that we have to endure. But what, what he's saying is this. I have to lay down my life to live the life that God wants me to live. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, He lives within us. And the life which I now live in the flesh, again, I am alive. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul lays it out very clearly. God gave His life for me so that I can have a relationship with God. I ought to lay down my life for Him and tell others about the gospel. Because it's all about what he did for me. And so he goes on. I shouldn't have come down, but I'm go right back to it. He goes on in the next verse to say this. In verse 19, or excuse me, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He said, I want to be very careful to let everybody know this. If you are made righteous by the law, then Jesus coming, living a perfect life, and willingly dying for the sins of man is pointless. These are heavy words. And what Paul's saying is this. It's not about the law. It's not about being under bondage of the law. It's about the liberty that Jesus Christ gave when he died for our sins. We have a relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by our works. And so many people in our world today are like the Jews back then. Now, they might not have the same dietary laws. They might not have the same laws for their clothing. They might not have the same issues uh, that, that, that they have to face that the Jewish people face. But here's what they do think. I think I've been a pretty good person. If you were to ask somebody, if you were to die today and you were to go uh, stand before God, would you get into heaven? They would say, I think so. I've done a lot of good with my life. I mean, I never killed anybody. I, I never stole from anybody. And they'll start to put their works up as a way to get into heaven. But here's what we see very clearly in this passage alone. Our works are not how we get to heaven. No matter what good you do, no matter how much good you do, when it is weighed with your sin, you lose every single time. Because our righteousness is filthy to God. 
It is not about what we can do. It is not about what laws we can keep. It is not about what kind of a good person we can be. Look, you cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. You cannot be good enough to have a relationship with God. It is all about Jesus Christ and what He did for us so that we can have that relationship with God. I keep saying that over and over and over. I hope it's clear. I hope we understand. If you're here today and you have never placed your faith in Jesus and you have never realize that it is your sin that separates you from God, then you are in trouble. If you stand before Him, you will be found wanton. If you stand before Him, you will be found coming short of God's glory because you cannot do good enough. We have to place our faith in Him. And if you've never done that, I hope you realize God loves you. He cares for you. He loves you so much that He saw the works that you would try to do. He saw the life that you would try to live so that you could try to earn this good standing with Him. And He said, it's not good enough, so I will go and I will make a way. And He, he willingly died so that you can place your faith in Him and you can have a relationship with God. That's the plan. That's the plan. So this morning, please understand your good is not good enough. I do not stand up here and say that with a prideful heart. I don't want to tear anybody down, but I want you to know very clearly, your good is not good enough. It, it won't work. It won't work. It can't work. But the good news is, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can have that relationship with Him. I'm so thankful for it. You say, well, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It's very possible for you as a, as a saved person to get caught up in works. That's what happened to the Galatians. They got caught up in another gospel now, they believed that in Jesus, and, and we believe, even what this passage alluded to, once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are saved, and nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can pluck you from the hand of the Father. It cannot happen. But that doesn't just give us the license to sin, God forbid. Right? That doesn't just give us the license to live however we want. But there is a draw back to works. There is a draw to live up to a standard I just want to encourage us as believers, be careful. Be careful not to be drawn back to this works-based living. Because we are crucified with Christ. Not dead, we live. So there is a way in which Christ wants us to live. And He doesn't want us to live under the bondage of the law. He wants us to live under the freedom and the liberty that Christ gave Salvation, Christ's sacrifice is not just about a ticket to get to heaven. It's about a way of living and Him giving us the grace that we need and the help that we need so that we can live victorious through Him as we live day by day by day. We don't have to live this life alone, and I'm thankful for that. He will lead us and He will guide us. Don't attach to works for your standard of righteousness after you've been saved. Don't make that the standard that you have to live to and that everybody else around you has to live to. That's not what God designed. That's not what God had in mind. Well, then if I don't have a standard that I'm going to live to, then, then I just get to do whatever I want whenever I want. And, and now look at me, I'm going to be a sinner out here. No, no. Did you not hear what he wrote? He just said, don't do that. God forbid. Why would I uh, uh, build up that, or why would I tear down that which was just built up? Why would I go back to the sin that, that God had to save me from? So it's not about that. I'm just telling you, be careful, be mindful, keep your eyes open to the, to the possibility that you could too fall back to this standard or this, this, this law and this life of bondage. And maybe even add to it so that others have to live to that as well dangerous and scary place to find yourself. It's not what God intended. 
not what God intended at all. I'm thankful Jesus came and he died for our sins. If you're here and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I know you feel the same way. But to go back to it, if you don't know Christ, please, please don't trust your works. Please don't trust the good that you've done. Your grandma could not have gotten saved for you. Well, my grandma prayed for me every day. Well, that's great. And I would say that the reason that you're here today might be because of the prayers of, the, of your grandma to hear this truth. But the prayers of your grandma or your mom or your dad is not going to get you through. It's not going to get you there. It's not going to help you to have a relationship with God. Your works, baptism, church membership, there are so many different things that people try to add to try to have a relationship with God. I'm just telling you, even if an angel comes from heaven, if anybody else preaches any other gospel than this, let them be accursed. It's false. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. God, I do ask this morning that you'll speak to hearts. Lord, if there is somebody who's here who does not know you as their Savior, and maybe they've, they've lived a great life, and they've done their best, and they've been charitable, and they've been giving, and they've been the most selfless person that they could be, and they have genuinely tried their best so that they can have a relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for their good works. We thank you for the good that they've tried to do with their life. But God, I pray that you'll help them this morning to realize that all of that good is not good enough because it doesn't even make it to the scale to weigh out against our sin. There is one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. Lord, the truth is this. We've heard it this morning, straight from your word. We are now accountable with what we've heard. And Lord, if there's somebody who's here who has not done it your way, help them to realize it's your way or no way. Lord, help them to humble their heart. Help them to come forward and, and ask somebody about how they can know you. Lord, help them to catch me or somebody after the service and, and, and make sure that they don't leave this building here today without knowing you the way that you want to be known. God, I pray for those who are here and who have accepted you as their Savior. Lord, we want to first and foremost thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us so that we can have a relationship with God. Lord, we thank you for that. But God, I pray that you'll help us to be reminded that we too can be pulled away. We too can be pulled into a different way of thinking. Lord, not pulled away from our salvation. We know that, that once we're saved, we are saved forever and there's nothing that, that, that can change that. But we can be pulled away in mindset. We can be pulled away in thought. So Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be reminded of that. God, I pray you be at this time of invitation. We ask that you'll do what only you can do.